Philippians chapter 3, let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the blessings of this day. We thank you for this opportunity to assemble, to open your word, to study from it, to meditate upon it. We thank you that you've given your word to guide us, to give us strength and wisdom. We thank you for the hope that we have because we look forward to eternity with you. We pray that you will bless us now as we study, that it will be pleasing in your sight and helpful and encouraging to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Philippians chapter 3. Let's just dive right into it and read verses 1 through 11. Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Who can I get to read that for us? John. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes with the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His suffering, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Okay. So... Through this section, Paul's warning about false brethren, their basis of action, and he gave the Philippians the true reason for life and where to put their focus, of course. Um, he warns them about false brethren here and false practices and concepts and teachings and things like that. But it's interesting in verse 1, chapter 3 here, where he says that they are to rejoice. He opens this up with rejoice. It's a theme, of course, through this letter to the Philippians about having joy and rejoicing. But he makes sure to remind them, rejoice in this. And then he follows that up with this specific warning. And question number one gets to it. How did Paul expect the Philippians to view the warning he was about to give them? What does he say? How does, what does he say they should see this as? How they should see it. As a huh. safeguard, I mean, uh, right? A means of protecting them, you know. Of course, a warning that he is sent forth. Right, exactly. Um, in life, when we're warned about a danger, especially if we are about to step into that danger, or encounter that danger, or experience the negative impact of a danger, and somebody warns us about that, how do we feel? Well, you feel good because you, you have knowledge of what is about to come. Right. If you travel throughout the world, you go on the State Department's website, it tells you, if you go here, stay away from this, this, and this place of these cities because they are known to uh, prey on Americans, tourists, whatever. So when you, you always should check that website before you go anywhere in the world because it, it's pretty pretty active. Yeah, you, you've got this... Relief, because you know. John? And he's telling them to rejoice, but his, he specifically says rejoice in the Lord. And he, tra and he transitions into those who don't rejoice in the Lord. They rejoice in the flesh. So he's warning them, don't rejoice in the flesh, as we're getting ready to see in the next verses, but rejoice in the Lord. But he explains it in detail. Right, right. And he, he says it's not tedious. It's not tedious for me. So from the teacher's perspective, what's, 
what's he saying or what should the teacher's perspective be on these things? It's not troublesome for me to warn you of these things. Okay, yeah, it's not troublesome for me to warn you about these. And it's safe for you. It's good, it's beneficial, it's helpful for you. Is this how most people view warnings of danger and error and false brethren? No. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's unfortunate that when you start warning about things, and especially with the type of, let's say, bluntness that Paul uses, that people get offended, they get upset, they get uncomfortable. And he's just reminding them here, this is something good. This is something good. Keep that in mind. What I'm about to tell you is really good for you. And we need to keep that in mind as well. And Bear's pointing out, Stephen, that he's, he's after their spiritual safety, not their physical. You mean the physical right. is not their concern. It's purely spiritual is what he's warning about. We've all seen what happens when we warn a fellow member. He's not teaching something right. we got to talk to him about it. Next thing you know, he, he's upset. He gets his little group together. Next thing you know, it splits the congregation. So you got to... That, that, that's what happens. But unfortunately, that's, that's fine. As long as we're continuing to do God's will and teach the truth. Right, right. We have to be committed to this and to see the goodness of it and appreciate other brethren who appreciate these warnings to encourage and strengthen one another and to realize that yes, there are those who do not like it, but there are those who embrace it, who support it, who encourage it. We need these kinds of things so that we can avoid the dangers and the error because ultimately what happens is people end up losing their souls. Now question number two I had asked, list the description Paul uses, give the meaning or the sense of them and tell who these people are and maybe are not. So verse two when he says beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. What, what are these, what's the meaning of these here? And then who are these people? Well, beginning with dogs, um, over in Revelation 22 and 15, he says, But outside are dogs, sorcerers, sexual immoral, and murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. And then in verse 18 and 19, he says, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, who's in this destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So, Stephen is doing for us a comparative. Mm -hmm. And he's describing people that are outside of Christ as dogs. And as we understand, dogs bite and devour one another. And he's warning us with this first point that we need not to be that way, but recognize that behavior. Right, exactly. When... When he's talking about dogs, he's not talking about a dog named Fluffly or Puddles or something like that. What he's talking about is they're filthy, mangy, vicious animals. Right. They're, they're pests. Um, we, you know, we don't experience this a lot, but if you've been overseas, a uh, third world country, they have just wild dogs roaming. And those things are nasty and disgusting and you don't want to be around them because they carry all kinds of disease for one, plus there may be rabies, they may attack you. Uh, so that's what he's talking about when he says they're dogs. And I'm going to add to that point, exactly to your point, dogs that, at, at that time were not commonly household pets. They were wild, roaming, vicious creatures. Descendants from wolves, that's what they were. They weren't the little good little puppies that we have and we love as part of our family. Right. And exactly, in third world countries that I've been in, you have a detail that every day goes out and kills the dog so they don't come in. Yeah. And that was, that's, that's a job. Right. Yeah. But as Ron read there, a dog is out to satisfy his own belly. And that's what he's saying with these 
people are, they're out to satisfy the flesh because that's what a dog does. All the dog is concerned about is satisfying what he wants, what he desires, and that's what he's comparing those folks to. These people just, just want to satisfy the flesh. They're not, they're not worried about the spiritual aspect of serving God. Right, exactly. It says they are evil workers. What's that idea of evil workers? They work evil. Okay. Uh, any other way to put that? Well, they manipulate. You could you could actually say okay. manipulation because let's say they come into church, and a lot of people do this. Uh, they come in for a social, you know, thing to get to know the people of the local, so that they, you know, they're even taught that in certain sales courses. Oh, go go to local church so that you know people, you have contacts, mm -hmm. and oh, you might be able to sell them your products later on. Right, right. The, these people are filled with sin, they're unholy, and wrong? I think, as you mentioned, Stephen, in that they're workers, they're not passive about this. They're active. Right. They're working it. Exactly. They are actively promoting evil. They're not passive victims of it. They are actively engaged and dedicated and invested in this evil. Um, so he says mutilation. What's the mutilation? I think that's again an interesting contrast because speaking to Jews, you know, they're a mutilation in that they're not the genuine continuation of circumcision, but they're a mutilation, they're a perversion now of what they should have been is maybe one way to consider this. Okay, any other thoughts there? Clint? I think it's a reference to the Judaizing teachers who, you know, so these would be Jews who would be Christians, but they would still hold fast to, you must be circumcised to be saved. And so Paul is, I think, playing on that idea to say, you're just mutilating your body. And then he goes on to say in the next verse, for we are the circumcision. So he qualifies it with, circumcision is okay. But there's a reason for that circumcision, and you're just mutilating your body. Okay. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 12, he's in dealing with this same issue of circumcision, he says, I would that they would even cut themselves off. Now, we recoil at that language, but what he's saying there is that if they're going to cut off the foreskin, and think that makes them holy, they might as well just cut it all off. Sometimes we read these things and we go, wow, is that really there? Uh, we, we would shy away from such things. When he's talking about mutilation, he's talking about they're mutilating their body, a certain part of their body, thinking it's making them holy. And Paul here is using extreme sarcasm to, to cut them down and to, to pull it back, pull that curtain back and let people see this is exactly who they are. Because this is, you know, in this, in this letter, we, we generally read this letter and we think this is very encouraging, and it is, and we have joy and rejoicing and all of that, but this is one of the most brutal responses to false doctrine that there is. As he tells them, you know, these guys are dogs, they are evil workers and they are the mutilation. That's who they are. So he's very pointed as he identifies these false teachers. Now, to modify what Clint said, these would be Jews who are Judaizing teachers, but it would also include any Gentiles who've bought into this idea. Because if you notice here, he's not merely focusing on teachers. He's focusing on the people who have accepted this concept and are practicing it. So he's including everybody in this. You guys are wrong. You are in sin. And he's warning the rest of the brethren at Philippi, don't go down that road. Now, let's understand that these are Christians. These are not outsiders. Because... There's different warnings in the Bible about people from without. He's talking about people from within. They are baptized believers. They would be those who would have been moral. He doesn't say, the look what the circumcision does. It, it takes you into drunkenness and adultery. That's not what he's doing here. 
These people are religiously zealous in what they're doing. And so we need to understand that these are erring Christians who've come in or working among the brethren and spreading this error of bindings, particularly where God has not bound. So then verse 3, that contrast again is, for we are the circumcision who worship God. They're the false circumcision. We're the true circumcision. And Romans chapter 2 talks about the circumcision being the circumcision of the heart. And how that, in, in if you connect the teaching of the Bible, really in Colossians chapter 3, which uh, we'll get to Lord willing later, or Colossians 2 rather, talks about the circumcision of Christ being that of baptism. That that's where our circumcision is now. That's the thing that brings us into covenant with God. And so we are the circumcision. We're the ones in covenant relationship with God, not them. We worship God in the Spirit. We worship in spirit and in truth. That's who we are. We rejoice in Christ, not in the flesh, as has been mentioned before. And so some people, if we declared this today, let's say... Um, whether it's false brethren or people caught up in false religion, we say, well, you know, the Baptists, they're an error. Their church, their doctrine, their practices are not in the Bible. We do the truth. A lot of people would see that as, well, you think you're better than everybody else and you think you're the only ones going to heaven. Well, Paul is doing that exact thing right here. They're an error. We're not. They're unfaithful, we are. And we, as God's people, need to keep that firmly in mind. There is a distinction, there is a difference, and we shouldn't be ashamed of that and to identify that and have some confidence we're doing what is right. Any other thoughts down through three? See that you just mentioned here in, in the comparative that he's given us, you know, and we understand that circumcision was putting off a piece of the flesh, but as you just noted here, we put off all flesh, and that is the circumcision in Christ. Again, how much greater is that circumcision that we are now a part of versus the contrast of what they're claiming and practicing, you know? Yeah. The, the, ball. the outward versus the inward. Right. Yeah. Out of the heart spring the issues of life. And so we have transformed, been changed. Exactly right. Now question number three, does anything stand out among Paul's credentials, what and why and all of that? So he goes into this. He says, okay, here these guys are coming along and saying, look, look at us. Look at our credentials. Look at our pedigree. Whether it's Judaizing teachers or even Gentiles who would come along and they would say, well, look, I'm now circumcised. I'm... I'm more holy than you. You need to be circumcised too. So Paul lists out these things. Okay, if you want to lay down who's, who's got the greater credentials here, well, here's what I've got. So it's, he, you go through these. Is there anything that sort of jumped out at you there? I, I, I like that. Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law. That means he knows, he knows the law. He, he pretty well could write the law from memory. So. Okay. Paul was in training to be a doctor of the law, essentially. He was, he was in training in Judaism that he would be one of those in the New Testament called lawyers. We think of them differently today, but he would have been an expert in the law. So, yeah. Any other thoughts there? Stephen, what jumped out to me is he refers to himself as blameless. But we look at Paul's life and we would draw other conclusions. However, he is correct. He's not saying he was sinless. He's saying he was blameless. He's not saying that he was perfect because in this text he goes on and talks about that. But he, what he did, he did out of a good conscience. And that's, as you were just previously stating, it's in the mind, it's in the heart that we keep ourselves right with God. Right. And when he was practicing Judaism, he did it with dotting the I's and crossing the T's. 
And so if he sinned, he offered that sin offering. He was there for the feast days. He was doing all those things that the law required him to do. Again, not sinless, but blameless. He kept the law. And you, you couldn't go and, and take his life and say, you did not do this. You didn't keep the Sabbath here. or you, you forgot this feast day here or whatever it would be. No, Paul was a guy who lived what he believed. He practiced, if you will, what he preached. And you go through these things and you have this national and religious purity, circumcised the eighth day as opposed to a Gentile proselyte who would have been circumcised at 20, 30, 50 years old or whatever. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day, just like the law said. The stock of Israel, he had ethnic and genetic purity. Hebrew of Hebrews, he had cultural purity. He wasn't a Hellenized Jew. He was a Hebrew to the core. Religiously, he was a Pharisee, which he makes note of what? What's Pharisees? What are they known for? It says here's zeal, so that's very their their traditional zeal for their traditions and sticking to it and not letting anything get past them. Exactly. Paul talked about they're the strictest sect. I, that's that's who I was in. Clint. This is the, the sect, right? the group of Jews who Jesus was relentless on. Just, it seems like in his life on earth, he constantly was in conflict with this group. Yes. Just you know, never letting up, always pointing out, this is not the attitude, this is not the behavior, this is not the way. Right. I am the way, the truth, and the life, not them. Right. And there are times he picked a fight with them just to bring that out, just to expose that. So he was a Pharisee. He had zeal to the point of persecuting the church. And as we discussed, righteousness uh, of the law being blameless. Um, so verses 7 through 11 then, he says, but look, all these things that were gained to me, I've counted loss for Christ. So... What was it that Paul had as gain in his previous life? Well, he was, he was held in a high esteem. He was honored by the Pharisees. So he was going to be the new age, the new uh, ones who had zeal and zealous for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? He... If he'd stuck with it, he'd have been one of the men who sat on the council, the Sanhedrin, and no doubt one of the most influential ones, sort of like Gamaliel was. He, he was on that track. He had power, he had possessions, he had influence as he was rising up in Judaism. Um, he had the praise of his fellow Jews for what he was doing. A lot of backing. Uh, but he says, kind of all loss for Christ. So he willingly let go of earthly advantages for Christ. Counted all lost for him. Um, any other thoughts on that? Why does he go on to say he counted this loss? Verse 8, verse 9, verse 10. None of it was important because... If it was without Christ, it's no point, it's trash. It's nothing to be counted as worthy or of value. But if you're in Christ, if you have Him, you abide in Him, that's what was worth a, a, a value to Him. I think as he mentions there and see in verse 9, he's again making a comparative. It's not of his own righteousness as we understand. It's not of meritorious works. It's not of your credentials. It's not of who you are. But it's Christ. And he was lost in Christ. Christ was the one that endorsed him. Mm -hmm. So knowing Christ is the highest value treasure that we can ever have. And that's what Paul is saying here. He said all those other things, that, that, that resume that I just gave you of, of these high things that I achieved. You know, we talk about rough language, but he's, the literal word, what he used there, he said, that's dumb. That's mm -hmm. nothing. That's worthless. Right. That's waste. 
That's what, that's what he compares those previous things to. And he is, we're pointing out, he contrasts that with the most supreme, highest treasure that we could ever have. And that's knowing Christ, literally, you know, spiritually knowing and being in the Lord. That's, that's the highest value. There's nothing that can, that can compare to that. Right. Exactly right. So, he says, he counts all these things lost for a sake, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And what he's talking about here is that he would know the Lord. And it's not that I would know that Jesus Christ came into the world and died for sinners and that he's the Son of God, but he's saying that I would know him. That I would have this intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he, as he says here, my Lord, that's personal. He's my Lord, that I could know him. Be, be with Him, walk with Him, live with Him day in and day out, that He would influence me and shape me and that I would be like Him. It says He suffered the loss of all things. He was persecuted heavily, as we know. You just read through the book of Acts and you see that Paul was relentlessly pursued even from town to town by the Judaizing teachers and then, of course, eventually came up against Rome in that. But He says he's willing and glad to suffer loss for the sake of Christ, to gain Christ. Um, so question four I'd ask, what are some things you or we might need to count as lost, should be count as lost for Christ? What are things that we sacrifice, should be willing to sacrifice for Christ, other than everything? Worldly issues. Our families. Let's say that again, Chris. Worldly issues. Okay, worldly issues, worldly things, pleasures of the world, things like that. Families, jobs, education. <clears throat> like you said, it's all. But the, the things that we hold important in this life, we need to count as loss for Christ. Uh, friends that we cannot, for whatever reason, have them come to Christ. I mean, we continue to preach to them, continue to preach to them. At one point we should say, okay, we're going to separate ourselves because either they're going to influence me or I'm going to influence them. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this in preparing for this lesson. Think how many friends Paul had to separate himself from. All those people in Judaism, all his colleagues, all the companions that he was working with, side by side with. The, I don't know if if he had to split from some of the people that were traveling with him to Damascus. I don't know. I don't know if they were converted as well at some point, but there, there's so many things he gave up. We have to be willing to give up those same things, Ron. Government laws and legislation and legislators we may continue to find ourselves in conflict with, just as Paul did. Right, right. <laughs> um, Paul gave up his freedom. He suffered the loss of his freedom. And he gladly did that for the sake of Christ. We may give up freedoms for the sake of Christ, for the cause of truth. And be glad and willing to do that for our Lord and Savior. So, says he wanted to be, in verse 9, found in him, found in Christ. And this gets to question number 5. Um, and that's the idea of in life or in death, he wants to be found in him and to know Christ. And notice what it says here, to know him, verse 10, and the power of his resurrection. Anybody have a thought on what he's saying there when he says to know him and the power of his resurrection? I think, again, it's a, it's a contrast that he's shown between the things that are temporal versus those things that are eternal. And the resurrection shows us that there is eternal life. Okay. It definitely shows us that there is eternal life. And what he's pointing out here is that that resurrection is what drives me every day. The power of his resurrection... The only reason Paul changed 
So on the road to Damascus, the resurrected Lord appeared to him. And he was like, okay, you're Lord. What do you want me to do? Because the resurrected Lord appeared to him. In 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about he was seen by me last of all. That the reality of the resurrection completely changed Paul's life everything he was about, what he valued, what he pursued, where his energy was poured in his life, and everything. And that's what we need. That the resurrection is the reason we live. The reason we pursue things. is because that resurrection is overwhelming, dominating. It's a reality. And that's going to drive every decision in my life. Um, Think John, Hank, and then Rick. John. Well, to take it a step further, we're to imitate Christ. We're doing these things because this is what Christ did for us. He counted all things for loss, gave up everything, including uh, His rights as God, for us. And He wants us to do the same thing. Paul looked at that resurrection and counted that most wonderful, but it also meant that Paul, in imitating Christ, could also attain that resurrection. That's what he's looking for. That he can he can be resurrected someday, just like Christ was. He looks at Christ's resurrection and says to himself, Hey, I can Christ is going to give me that too if I remain faithful and count all these things as loss. We gotta remember during that time period, I wasn't just there was there was more people claiming they were Messiah than Jesus. It had happened before, but nothing happened. We sometimes think Jesus is the only one that did that, but if you study the history, they had you know, false prophets, false teaching, mm -hmm. and that's what they were dealing with. When Jesus came along and said, He's a Messiah, oh, here's another guy, here's another guy saying He's a Messiah. And that's, and, but none of them had this, the Holy Spirit in them like, like Christ did, and was able to do the things He did. They just tried to get influence and power, and it's it died out. It always died out. Right. There were infallible proofs with Christ. Rick? Just a quick point. Um, verse 11 stands out to me. If by any means I may obtain to the resurrection of the, from the dead. So by any means, Paul is saying that he was going to obtain that resurrection from the dead, the, the final resurrection, not not the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of the dead. Right. Knowing the reality of Christ's resurrection and everything that comes with that, Him teaching about judgment, the final resurrection, here's how you can participate in that, here's how you can have a home in heaven. This is Paul's obsession in life as he's serving the Lord. And he says that I can know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. He is embracing the suffering and the persecution that is there. We, we try to avoid it. We, we try to get away from that. Everything from embarrassment and ridicule and all of that to more extreme forms. We... We don't want that. Paul's saying, I, I'm, I'm glad to step right out there in the middle of it. I know those sufferings. And I'm willing to embrace those because of what it means, because of what He has done for me in being conformed to His death, willing to lay it all on the line because, as we've said, His goal is his, what's in, in front of Him. I want that resurrection. I want to be in heaven. That's what he's thinking about. All right. hate to do it, but let's move on. Verses 12 to 16. 12 to 16, who will read that for us? Clint. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Okay. Um, Paul here urges them to press on, of course, in unity. And he's pressing toward that goal. What does he admit in verse 12? He admits that he is not perfected yet. That perfection is yet to come, but that he is working as we understand and describe it. He's progressing each and every day. Could we say Paul was still growing? Yes. Wow, Paul was still growing? You know, that tells me, and of course the Bible would teach, that I'm, I'm never going to be fully there in this life. I am going to continually grow. And we can't get to the point of saying, well, I'm done, I, I've had enough, or I feel like I've invested enough or done enough so far. I, I've got to keep going and keep going and keep going. Clint. And that's evident in uh, verse 15. He says, let those of us, so he's including himself here, who are mature. But he qualifies, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I may be mature, but I'm not done. I'm never done. And that's the attitude that we all have to attain to. Right. Now, in the New King James, he says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Christ laid hold of Paul when he appeared to him and then, of course, subsequent revelations. He, he grabbed on to Paul, if you will, and he put Paul into the ministry to go and to preach the gospel. And Paul's saying, I'm grabbing on to that. He laid hold of him. For that, he laid hold of him that he may have eternal life. And Paul's saying, I'm grabbing on to it. Grabbing on to everything that the Lord has grabbed on to me for. And he's pressing forward in that. And verse 13 then, he says he hasn't apprehended, but what is he doing as he's pressing on? Not looking back. Um, what are some things we need to forget? Question six. We need to forget the achievements, the great things that we've done, but we also need to forget the bad things that we've done and, and, the, and the things that need to be left in the past and press forward to that goal of attaining that resurrection from the dead. Okay. Um, when Paul says forgetting those things which are behind, is he saying I don't remember them? I think sometimes maybe we, we get that in mind that <laughs> if we forget something, you know, because we use that term as, I forget what they said, I forget this. It literally is like wiped clean out of our mind. We just can't recall it. He's, he's not saying that he's forgotten. He just went through a whole list of things that he did and was, and you look at other places and he references his past. So he hasn't forgotten where he was. And he talks about, you know, in 1 Timothy, he was the chief of sinners. But had Paul put that sin behind him? Had Paul put that career he had before behind him? That's what he's talking about forgetting. He's able to let go of those things yep. and not let, the, not let it hold him back because most of us would have such a guilty conscience that we put to death Christians, we couldn't get over it. He was able to do that through Christ. Right, exactly. He, he let go of those things is the idea of forget here. Clint? This is going back to Hebrews. Lay aside every weight. Just forget about it, as in don't let it be a chain or a weight that holds you back or in, in some way produces a stumbling block to your future because of, you can't get over your past. 
leave it where it was. I think, again, there's a contrast here that we can recognize, and it's not only failures, but it's accomplishments, as you were talking about Paul and all the credentials that he had, his education, the position, all the things that he amassed. We've got to let go of those things, too. Not only the failures or the things that we now recognize were in error, but also the things that we thought were accomplishments that truly were not. Right, exactly right. We, we've got to leave all that behind. All, all of our spiritual accomplishments, even since we've become Christians. You know, it, it doesn't matter what we did yesterday or the day before. That doesn't mean we can just let it all go today. We've we got to keep pressing forward. we got to keep going and press toward the goal, that crown of righteousness that is awaiting us. Now, as Clint mentioned just a moment ago, said, therefore, as many as are mature have this mind. And then he talks about, you know, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind in the New King James there. Um, he's just simply recognizing there's different levels of maturity, different levels of growth among Christians and where we have a like understanding, let's stand together because you think about these Philippians, how early this still was in the gospel being taught and how that they had not received all the letters that had been written by this time because all the letters, for one, hadn't been written by this time. And he's saying, look, when you understand truth, stand together in that truth. And there's going to be more to come but don't follow that error. Don't go down that road is one of the underlying ideas here. So you need to, to stand united in truth. Any other thoughts there through 16? All right, let's briefly cover 17 through 21. Who will read that for us? Ron? Brethren, Join in my following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Okay. So question number seven I had asked, who are we to follow or who are we to know and why? Well, Paul specifically, maybe Timothy and Epaphroditus, since he talked about them and those who are walking in righteousness. Yeah, look at them, note them. This is literally mark them, just like we are to mark those in error. He's saying mark those who are in truth and follow that example. And he says follow my example, which in this chapter in particular, following his example is completely laying bare the error and the people behind that error. Follow, follow my example. Live in truth and righteousness. Pursue that resurrection because of what Christ has done for you. So we're to follow good examples and to note them, encourage them, and appreciate them. Um, what about these bad examples? Because he says, you know, here are these ones who are a pattern for you. Here's a blueprint for you, which, by the way, he says by direct statement that we are to have patterns by example or authority by example. Um, verse 18, for many walk, and he says, I've told you often, tell you weeping. What are they? <coughs> Why do you think he says, I tell you even weeping? 
at the very beginning of the letter, he says that his joy and the things that are encouraging and building him up is to see their faith and their belief. And this is, again, the contrast to that. They're the enemies that he's been describing for us in this chapter in particular. Just like it should make us all sad when we see somebody that is not living and teaching the truth. That's that's what I see here is that, that weeping, the, the heartbreak that he gets from seeing this. And what was Paul's relationship with this church? Wasn't he involved with them since inception? And Timothy, and they worked and labored as we had noted in the book of Acts. Yes. Do you think he knew anyone who had succumbed to this error? You know, that's what comes to my mind when he says, you know, I tell you this weeping. It utterly broke his heart that people had gone down this path. And it just shows the, the, the working of Satan. He will come in and work among people, work among people that we know, that we love. He'll take them away and he'll use that against us to try to take us away too. But as we said before, we've, we've got to draw some clear lines. And even if they go away, we better be determined we're staying right where we need to stay with the Lord and not go down that path and be willing to confront it and to expose it as well. Clint. Back in Philippians 2, it says that we have to work out our own salvation. Right. And so that goes right along with what you're saying. Yep, yep, exactly right. Now, he, he says of these enemies of the cross, now let's understand, these are Christians who are enemies of the cross of Christ. It says their end is destruction. They're going to hell, whose God is their belly. What John mentioned a while ago, their, their, ap their physical carnal appetites is what's driving them. That's, that's what they follow after whose glory is in their shame. They glory in circumcision, but that's to their shame. You know, it's amazing how many people get caught up in error, and that error is kind of the thing that they carry around as a torch for everyone to see. Hey, look at this! And they don't even recognize it's so shameful. Why would you do that? Well, these people were doing that with following the circumcision, following after the uh, pleasing men. You know, even Peter fell to the pressure in Galatians chapter 2 of separating from the Gentiles because of the Judaizing teachers. You know, there's, there's people who crave that attention, crave that approval. He says, <coughs> this is how these people are, and they set their mind on earthly things. And then again, as Ron's been pointing out, he brings out this contrast again. They're looking at earthly things, but where are we to look, Chris? We always have to be aware of the congregation uh, for anyone who will come in and so in confusion and discourse amongst us. Exactly. Exactly right. These things can come in and wreak havoc in a congregation. So, he says... They follow those earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our focus is. And with our citizenship in heaven and looking forward, we're eagerly waiting for the Lord, Jesus Christ. He's talking about His return and the judgment. And what's going to happen at the judgment? Verse 21. Transformation is going to occur. Transform our lowly body, this earthly body, into one that's suited for a home in eternity. As Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, we're all going to be changed in a blink, uh, twinkling of an eye. We're going to be changed. And he's saying that's where you need to focus. That's where we need to focus. You know, this life is tr struggles, it's trials, and, and when you have, as they are having here, conflict among brethren and all of that, it can cause us to grow weary and discouraged and to want to just 
oh, I just want to give up. He's saying you can't do that. Stay focused on the prize that is ahead of you. That will keep motivating you that way, understanding what the Lord has promised. All right, we're out of time. Thank you all very much. Lord willing, Philippians chapter 4 next week.